Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. A Prime Minister is first among equals, or primus inter pares. Australia has had 31 Prime Ministers, some lasting a mere few months, while others, like Robert Menzies, many, many years. The office of the Prime Minister in Australia has changed dramatically since Federation, but the size of the Prime Minister's office doesn't necessarily correspond with longevity or effectiveness in that office. Joining me today to discuss the evolution of the office of the Prime Minister is Professor Jim Walter, Emeritus Professor of Political Science at Monash University. Welcome to Afternoon Light, Jim. Thank you. Happy to be here. It's good to have you here at the Robert Menzies Institute and talking about the Office of the Prime Minister, no less. What an appropriate topic and I feel like we should have had you on much earlier, set the scene for all our work. But Jim, the Office of the Prime Minister, I mean, just in pure numbers terms, of course, but as a concept has changed so much. What was it envisaged at Federation to be like and how to function and the like? Well, at Federation it was envisaged to be really just a secretariat, a handful of people who would handle correspondence, have some connection with the Prime Minister's department, but most of the serious work would go on in the Prime Minister's department with public servants, even though that was also very small at the time. But the office itself was really sort of stenographers and not much else. There were no political advisers. There were no real press advisers. It starts to grow with Billy Hughes, who was the first Prime Minister to bring in a sort of a press person, you know, to, to get the message out. And it goes on from there. But really, the office itself doesn't expand greatly in that first 45 years. It's not until well after the Second World War that the office, as we've come to know it now, starts to appear. And presumably at Federation, the office was modelled on what you saw in the Premier's offices or the British model? Most of the initial Prime Ministers, the big men of colonial politics from their own states. Yes. And so they had fairly lofty ideas of their status. But they also, in many cases, had a lot of experience in those Premier's offices. And not all of them became Prime Minister. You know, John Forrest wasn't Prime Minister, but Deacon, Barton and all those people, they were well aware of how things worked. And they really just translated that into the federal system. But the idea of how small it was was that this famous quote from Edwin, Edmund Barton, who used to travel back and forth with the briefcase, as you would, and he said at one point, the whole record of the government is in my briefcase. That was the archive. <laughs> what efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> Just in terms of physical structure, so the Parliament starts to sit in Melbourne, of course, yeah. and the yeah. beautiful Parliament House on Spring Street in Melbourne. But, I mean, was the Prime Minister's office just a very small room? Usually it was just a small room, yeah, you know, it outside. It didn't need to be very big, did it? Outside the Prime Minister's actual office. Right. As you'll find, you know, quite a lot of executive positions in non-parliamentary settings today. It was either one that you had to go through or next door to the Prime Minister and that remained, again, pretty much the case until the middle of the 20th century. Did you get a sense that it was hard in those early years for the media to find an opportunity to speak directly to the Prime Minister because there was no gatekeeper or was it easier because there was no gatekeeper? Well, it depended very much on the Prime Minister. Some of them were very... Billy Hughes, for example, was a sort of polemicist and always he was speaking directly to the press. But this press fellow that he appointed with him to the Versailles conference and then wrote a book that was sort of a largely meant to be Billy Hughes, but written by this chap. Is this Billy Hughes Goes to Paris? Yes. I have that in my bookshelf, yes. (laughs) And um, so they could be very important, but they had a secretary who 
to some extent with on their instructions decide who got in and who didn't. But they all knew the, the importance of the press and they all often had relationships with editors and that sort of thing. What about the impact of Stanley Bruce? Because he did change the office from the chaos of Billy Hughes, didn't he? Well, he had Stanley quite Bruce, important. I think, is a very is a significant figure. It wasn't so much the personal office that he changed, but he was committed to what he called scientific management, modern theories of or modern practices of management. And was he getting that out of the UK or the well, US? Well, he worked or? in the UK yes. in yeah. one of the family companies and he got it out of a lot of the work that was going on in business circles, better management So styles. sort of almost corporatising the and so office. that's what he was trying to introduce, but he did it through the public service. It's mm. the start of the public service really, again, until the war is more or less a sideshow. Well, relative to what it is today. <laughs> but it's Stanley Bruce who starts to streamline it and, and to bring in these new ideas, management ideas. And so he's a very significant hinge point. But it was World War Two. you keep saying, that really was a catalytic in yeah. changing how the office of the Prime Minister evolved and, and also the relationship with the bureaucracy and what the bureaucracy was to do. Yeah. Well, there's a very good book by Stuart McIntyre called Australia's Boldest Experiment, which is the best possible sort of history of this. But it was a period when not only a lot of the intelligentsia, academics and so on, particularly economists, were sort of dragooned into public service positions Mm. in aid of the war effort, but a lot of leading business people also became directors of munitions and all sorts of things. And so there was this dual thing where the public service starts to grow in a way that it never has before because a lot of these people, often young, Nugget Coombs is a primary example, but a lot of the people who worked with him, they came in and they stay. And basically the rudiments of the post-war public service get built in that wartime period where Mm. it's fighting for survival and to be honest, a sort of a command economy. They would determine where things got developed because it had to all be done in, in the war effort. It's then that what comes after the war, which is the Menzies period, starts because a core group of people that are employed not in the Prime Minister's personal office but in key roles in the public service come into office at that time. Coombs clearly was one, Mm. but by 1949 he's in the Commonwealth Bank. And so the really important transitional figure is a man called Alan Brown, who is probably one of the great public servants of the 20th century. And his relationship with Menzies becomes very important in what follows. If we could just focus on World War II and Curtin for a bit. I mean, yep. he starts to use media management, as all leaders do, Absolutely. of course, during yeah. wartime. Yeah. It's propaganda is incredibly important yep. for boosting up the domestic population and creating a bogeyman of the enemy and giving people a sense of urgency to give everything for the war effort. So he's really focused on that media management. How does that evolve in terms of the architecture of the office, his office, but also the public service? Well, I think the great advantage that Curtin had was that he'd been a journalist. Mm. He had very good contacts and experience. And so he does it not particularly by appointing people around him, but by building up direct relationships with key journalists. Right. So he's not using a media advisor no, for the no, stage or because any, yes. I mean, we're talking in the age of the press, you know, the press is absolutely king Mm. and he's right right across that. Mm. And so, yes, it's a very important role that the media plays but he's doing it directly by planting stories or, you know, (laughs) talking to journalists, bringing them into the office and building up their sort of trust in him because he says, well, I'll tell you this but you can't publish it 
yet, that mm. sort of thing. Yeah. So it becomes that sort of reciprocal thing. Of Quite collaborative too. Collaborative, yes. but you're getting something special here mm. and I expect this in return. This has to be handled properly. And, Jim, what about the role of the Prime Minister through this period in keeping the party together? Because by the early 1940s you've seen political parties yeah, yeah, come and go, yeah, particularly yeah. on the centre-right, but that sense of party discipline and, you know, you're in wartime. The Prime Minister's office, no doubt, is important in well, this respect. Certainly the leader is. I mean, two things I'd say about that. Firstly, the Labor Party was in a real mess after 1930. It took a long time to rebuild it. And then when Curtin becomes leader, there are people sort of wanting to re visit these more radical ideas they'd had in the past and he's saying, no, people are not going to wear that. Mm. And they would call out at conferences saying, but in 1930, and he said, I remember that very well, that was when I lost my seat. (laughs) And and even as in the early 40s, well, we can talk about this in a minute, but the divisions in the United Australia Party had started to emerge. And Curtin's followers are saying, you know, you should go for it now. And he's saying, we have to be ready for government. We have to persuade the people that we're ready for government. I'm not going to pull the pin until we're ready for government. Mm. And so he had a really important influence in bringing the fragments of the party together after the huge splits that happened in the 30s. And then in saying, hold your horses, we've got to build up to where a credible party of government. But you're really seeing that come from the leader himself, and let's be honest, well, they were yeah, all hymns back then, leader himself rather than well, political operatives. Well, always collaboration, you yeah. know, and Chifley is always an important partner yeah. for Curtin. But that's other politicians rather than it, yeah, the that's, functionaries, that's right. advisors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the same thing, I mean, in a sense, Menzies having fallen on his sword in 1941, he really almost single-handedly, well, he's not, not single, they're collaborators, there are other people doing important things, but he's the, the driver of sort of getting those fragments together again, developing a new liberal message that he starts to sort of seed through speeches, all those speeches through the 1940s, reorganising the party base. Now, of course he didn't do it alone, but it's really one of the great opposition leaderships of the 20th century about a man who's apparently failed in his first attempt and then is really responsible for rebuilding the party until it's in a position in 1949 to take power. So that sense, Jim, of having a philosophy which is what, as you say, Menzies spent those years yep. in the wilderness really honing, developing with collaborators, but, you know, it's obviously the familiar Forgotten People broadcasts are an articulation of that, but he was doing it in other mediums yep. as well. How important was it to have that philosophy as distinct from, say, the United Australia Party or the Nationalists who had had something which was a little bit more ambiguous? It was, you know, yeah, well, uh, often, I mean, they're often called non-Labor yeah, parties, as the, in, you know, pre- that was their big distinction. They weren't Labor. Yeah, the pre-war <laughs> Labor parties, the recurrent problem was that, as you saw in the leadership, they were often led, they were fragments of the old Labor Party that are now working in, in it's a United Australia Party because it brings the Labor dissidents across. Mm. And you have Billy Hughes, a former Labor Prime Minister becoming Nationalist Prime Minister and you have Joe Lyons becoming. Yes. So they are... Former Labor. Yeah. They are fairly sort of tenuous yeah. coalitions in a way. Mm. And it's not to say that none of those people had strong philosophies. Stanley Bruce certainly did. But it's not until after the war that those sort of divisions are resolved. Right. And in that 1940s period where Menzies, who knows Curtin and Chifley and in a lot of respects admires them, but nonetheless is wanting to say there's another way and we think this 
people are happier with this liberalism that I'm now propounding. I think it's a very important transition. Something that I find quite interesting is the continuity between Chifley and Menzies on a range of policies, I mean, you know, the Snowy Hydro Scheme, Immigration Program, getting closer and closer to the United States, which of course ends up with the ANZUS Agreement in 51. There is a sense of progression. There's obviously a divergence on economic policy around nationalisation of banks or not and getting rid of war rationing restrictions and the like and emphasis on private enterprise over state command economy. You've said that in the curtain chiefly period, and I think Menzies too, in the very early stages of World War II, they're bringing in private citizens into the public service to run the program, so, so the war, preparing yes. for war, yeah. but then there's post-war reconstruction as yeah, well. Yeah. So from the office, are we seeing this level of coordination or, again, is it still just from the public service no, with the Prime Minister at the sort of so apex? very much. I mean, it's partly because I think it's often called the age of the mandarins, as you probably know, <laughs> the period after the war from the late 40s through really to about the 1970s. And it's because there's this group of half a dozen very able public servants. The seven all dwarves. Of, all men, of course. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> and, but it's really because Menzies builds particular relationships with them. And, and I mentioned before Alan Brown. Alan Brown had been a disciple of Coombs. He was appointed by Chifley. And then he comes in after the change of government. And Menzies basically says, look, I don't care about your politics. And there was another much younger chap there in post-war reconstruction who, who was the president of one of the Labor Party branches in Canberra. And Menzies, he said to Menzies, is this going to be a problem? And he said, well, look, I don't care about your politics as long as you're serving the government. But I think it would be a good thing to, to step down from there. I mean, the president. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe just a quiet uh, member, a Alan sleeper. Brown. <laughs> so then you get these very sort of powerful figures. Jack Crawford, who's working with Jack McEwen, who's the tariff man, and Coombs, who's now at the Commonwealth Bank, but doing the role of a sort of national bank. And they have very different views. Mm. And it's so Alan Brown is the guy in the middle who has to negotiate with all these fairly mm. strong characters. And Menzies becomes to completely trust him. And often when he goes overseas, he takes him with him. So Brown is in there, I think, from about 10 or 12 years. And then when he finishes, he becomes ambassador to Japan and so on. But that relationship is really the core thing, and it's with the public service because the Prime Minister's Department now becomes this sort of coordinating centre, which it hadn't really been before. And so the office doesn't change. The actual personal office doesn't change much. Menzies had no designated political advisers in the office, but he had a couple of press secretaries that he was close to, and they are often his sort of antenna about yeah. the non-public service view of what was going on. But he was really relying on the Prime Minister's department to feed yeah. in yeah. to him personally yeah. Yeah. the information he needed to know yeah. to and, make and, decisions. And trusting them to yeah. say, this is our program, it's up to you to implement it. Tell me about... They're in Canberra. Menzies is at the Lodge. Canberra is a very, very small town. Yep. I mean, Menzies obviously in the 50s sets up the National Capital Development Commission to really make Canberra into the city we're much more familiar with today. But back then it was a country town yep. really and there wouldn't have been a lot of entertainment options for public servants. And so Menzies is – quite well known for Sunday nights, That's right. having the yeah. boys around who are really yeah. the top public yep. servants. Yep. And they have a lot of social engagements, which you can't imagine the Prime Minister these days getting together socially with all the sort of top bureaucrats no, in Canberra. No. So Sundays at the Lodge, dinner parties with the boys, drinks with ministers in the ante room after cabinet meetings. And then there's lots of goings on in the King's Hall in what we know now as Old Parliament House. It was actually quite a 
close knit yeah, community. It was. And people yes. often say who knew old Parliament House as a working Parliament House and new Parliament House, which I always laugh that we say it's new Parliament House and it's 35 years old, but they know the two buildings. They say it was much easier to bump into people in old Parliament House and actually a much more sort yeah. of collaborative yeah. environment. That's true. And it's certainly right that means he's, of course, the ones he called the boys were the ones he particularly, his circle. Yes, but John Bunting's memoir of Menzies has a wonderful sort of account of the boys and those social engagements and the idea that you could sort of run into people in King's Hall, although Menzies is becoming such a venerated figure that not too many people would sort of bowl up to him in, in King's Hall. They were comfortable with coming when he invited them round for drinks and things like that. But the story of a journalist sort of trying to buttonhole Menzies as he crosses King's Hall and saying, asking me a question, and he just says, my boy, you'll hear my answer when I'm talking about this in Parliament. (laughs) So he intimidated a lot of the press, according to some of the history, Clem Lloyd's history of that period, for example. It's interesting, Heather Henderson, his daughter, she has told me stories or at least sort of given observations about how her father responded to media questions. She says, you know, my father would be, you know, asked, say, you know, what do you think about you know, the Vietnam War, you know, what your policy is appalling? And he would actually just not answer. I mean, he would say, I'm fine, I'll give you my answer in good time or and be quite confident in that approach. Yes. Whereas she reflects that in today's climate, the expectation is you have to give some sort of an answer. Oh, Even yes. if it's an answer of obfuscation, you still have to yeah, respond. Yeah. Whereas he was very comfortable not to respond. In fact, didn't really give many interviews oh, that's right. and then would choose a time that suited him when he had something yes. particular he wanted to convey yeah. to give the interview or make the statement in Parliament and yep. that was what we're going to report on. Yeah, that's true. But it obviously is then a way to exercise much more power over your message than politicians to yeah, this day Yeah, I mean, can. I think what we've seen since has been the sort of professionalisation of media relationships and uh, we now know that the government ministers and the opposition shadow ministers all, all have their days talking points. They don't. Yes. <laughs> it's not just coming off the cuff. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Everyone's trying to second guess what they'll be asked what the opposition will be doing. And so the media people in the office become key figures. And in the contemporary prime minister's office, a minister's office will be hounded by the prime minister's press people if they don't stay on message and so on. And it's for both parties. It's not particular. To- and so that's one of the things that we need to think about when we think about the way the office has expanded and when it did and why it did. Jim, there are lots of theories about why Menzies stayed in office as long as he did from, so second time around from 49 to 66, incredible record that doesn't look like it'll ever be surpassed, but you never know, of course, you never know. know, There are theories about, well, he was blessed by his opposition and the Labor split. He was just someone who mastered the art of politics. But was there something about his relationship with the public service so he could set the overall tone and agenda and obviously deliver the killer messages when it counted and he was a fantastic orator that he was able to through really quite intimate and trusting relationships implement that agenda extremely effectively through these mandarins the seven dwarves if you like yeah that's true but Remember there were times that came very close to yeah. crashing out. And sure did, 61 and 54. 54, 61. Yeah. yeah. And I do think that the split in the Labor Party was an important factor, not just because it persists in the party, but because the creation of the, the DLP, Democratic Labor Party, the Catholic offshoot, which then always gives its preferences to the coalition, just carves off very significant portion of the Labor vote. So in that sense, he benefits from the terrible splits over, well, basically over communism. But Mm. the Labor Party has never really been a socialist party, despite the fact that it had the socialist objective in its sort of founding documents. 
when it comes to it, it's always been. I like to remind people that Herbert Everett wrote a wonderful essay, prize-winning essay when he was at university, in, I think it was 1915, about liberalism. And his view was that you know, the true liberalism was in the Labor Party and that was what he was fighting for. Now, we could go into a long explanation of why that sort of view of a sort of ameliorative liberalism was so strong among some. You know, Deacon, in a sense, was in that tradition of one who said you've got to have individual freedom, that's a primary objective, but if the state needs to give people who are falling behind a helping hand, then it's the job of the state to do that. And, and Menzies would have agreed with that. He, Menzies he, certainly was quite explicit about that. Yes, yeah, mo- moderating yeah, capitalism. Yeah. When he started and so after the war you had the mixed economy mm. and Australia was lucky too because the resources booms start to then kick in. But having said all that, yes, he was a fantastic rhetorician and he was a very, very skillful politician. All of those factors play into it. And as I've said, he built a really significant working relationship with the mandarins who were going to implement what the government wanted to do. Do you think after Menzies there has been a government in Australia who has been able to work so effectively and use so effectively the public services Menzies had? I do. And it's partly, I mean, to understand why you have to also look at the way the much expanded Prime Minister's offices worked with the public service later on. But the government that has done it most effectively is the Hawke government. And it's partly because you had a very strong sense of what they felt needed to be done. But they also, even though they had this expanded Prime Ministerial office, we haven't really got to that yet, but they had this practice which most successful Prime Ministers have had since, until I think, unfortunately, the early 2000s, of having very experienced public service figures as the principal private secretary in the private office. And you had a string of very effective people. With Hawke, it was Graham Evans, who was from finance, then later Sandy Holway, who I think it had been a diplomat at that stage. Keating had Don Russell, who'd been a public servant. Howard had, of course, Arthur Senadinus. All of them had people who knew how the public service worked. And I would say the most effective Prime Ministers since Menzies have been Hawke and Howard. Each case, not for their entire period of office, but for the most successful period for both of them. It was because of this collaborative development between the Prime Minister's office and the public service. It's interesting, and we will get on to how the Prime Minister's office expanded because that's a fascinating story, but I did just want to pick up on how the use of the public service, or I guess the control of the public service by the Prime Minister in that Keating-Howard era changed because it's interesting Keating's introducing contract appointments with limited tenure for top public servants Howard is introducing the Public Service Act in 99, giving the Prime Minister the power to appoint and terminate departmental secretaries. So there is a sense that these are not the the non-partisan mandarins who are just focused on implementing the policy or coming up with the policy. These are actually really tools of politics in some... Yeah, well, they they are now after those changes you quite rightly point to, first under Hawke, then under Keating and then Howard. The key public servants, departmental secretaries, are really subject to the decisions of ministers and prime ministers in a way that they hadn't been up to that point. And that is a significant change in the sense that, of course, I think most public servants throughout the post-war period have been committed to doing they're best to sort of satisfy what governments want. Interviewed a lot of these people, principal private secretaries, but also secretaries of prime minister and cabinet. And so you get people like Peter Shergold, for instance, comes into politics 
in the Hawke period to work really on immigration, multiculturalism, and then gets put into running APSIC. And then Howard comes along and he thinks, well, I'm a Labor appointee. Things aren't going to go well. Well, within two or three years, he's Secretary of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And it's because he quite rightly says, the job is to do your best to implement what the government wants. And so there's a succession of those people that continue, even this is after the contract appointment stuff has changed, but they're not doing it purely because their job might be under threat. They are usually doing it because they really believe in this ethos. Mm. We're here to serve the government of the day. Yes, yeah, which is you know, fundamental to the Westminster system, of course. So you know, Menzies retires in 66. The Prime Minister's office largely stays the same through the series of Liberal Prime Ministers up to Whitlam in terms of its yeah, it function and size. it doesn't grow So Holt, very much Gordon, bigger. McMahon don't fiddle around the edges too yeah, much. Yeah. No, they, the actual personal office doesn't change a lot. I think that it's slightly bigger. I've got books where I've given all the numbers. <laughs> I it's all right. Them. I'm not going to test you, Jim. But Whitlam does represent quite a dramatic change, doesn't yeah, he? I mean, yeah. on a whole range of things. Yep. It's you know, yep. 1972, he's elected after 23 years straight of Liberal government. So it is a big change for the country just in general. And he has different ideas about his office and the public service and, of course, the policy agenda is quite a dramatic one. Yes. Yeah. And he takes quite a long time to build up that policy agenda from becoming leader of the party after Colville in the 60s. And he's working on it even before that. He's a critic of Colville. Mm. <laughs> Almost gets thrown out of the party. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I think the interesting point about it is that in those years as opposition leader, he has a couple of key people who build this sort of alternative because oppositions can't get the same policy advice that governments get. He built this network, or at least he didn't. John Menadue and Race Matthews, who were, principal, who were his secretaries in opposition, built these networks and brought in all these interesting young people full of ideas. They were the ones. Whitlam said... You know, we've got to have this policy. But he was the big ideas yeah. guy. These guys provided the detail, the things that were necessary. And do you think that was a nod to the Curtin era of bringing in non-government people? Well, in, I think it's, it's you partly know, that. that sort of it's partly bringing in the young business people to it's, implement it's, their it's ideas. It's partly, you know, I have got these big ambitions. I can't get the advice I need just from my colleagues and the bits I can get from the public service. He was very adept at asking questions of the public service to get as much as he could. But this network of people who came in, they want to carry them into government with them. Right, you know? yeah. So that's the agenda. I think the interesting thing is the man who designs it is Peter Walensky, who's a public servant. And some of the public servants, they're still around, Terry Moran, for one, very, very young at that stage, but they're disciples of Walensky. And Walensky has ideas about how you would have a streamlined office and you, maybe the Prime Minister's office will be the driver of policy change. And so Ray Matthews, John Menadue, these others, they, they find out about this. They brief Whitlam. Whitlam asks Walensky if he'll provide him with a sort of map of how it should be done. And Walensky says, well, I will, but not until you win government. So before they get into government, they not only have all these specific advisors working on health, what becomes the Medi, Medibank initiative on housing, et cetera, et cetera. And Walensky's saying, OK, this is how it'll all work. And so when Whitlam wins, plans in place, they bring all these young, ambitious people in and they're into the Prime Minister's office? No, they're into, or into the, well, some of them are in the Prime Minister's office, but some are, are in public service. And Walensky soon decides that they have a policy advice unit and so on. But Walensky decides after a couple of years, this isn't the way to go. Right. It's the public service itself that, you know, we need to be geeing up. 
not by being the sort of questioning people from the PM's office, prodding them, but by actually changing the public service. And so his ambition then to become the public service commissioner. Ah, uh, yes. And have oversight of how and who gets appointed to the, all the, the key roles. So he sort of backs off this big ambitious prime ministerial office idea as indeed to many of those other young men who were behind him, like Terry Moran. If you ask Terry Moran today, or Don Russell, who worked for Hawke, about PMO, they're great critics of it. They say they're much too interfering and everything's gone wrong. and It's not what we planned. And, of course, Malcolm Fraser, who was the opposition leader, he's a critic of this, isn't he? He's a critic, but he says all these because a lot of these people came into the minister's offices, not just into the prime minister's office. I'm going to cut those staff. We don't need all this. We've got the public service. But in fact, what happens next is he's not really prepared to get rid of an effective prime minister's office with all these sort of different policy strengths, not only because it gives him ammunition against the public service if they're not responding exactly how he'd like, but it also gives him advantages over the rest of his colleagues. No one else can really match the Prime Minister, so it increases the Prime Minister's ability to sort of control. And someone like Menzies, who had been in that role for so long, yeah. he didn't really need to worry about that. No, no, he, no, he, he, you know, he, he was, knew where all the bodies were buried yeah, and he yeah, knew exactly, all those arguments exactly. that had been run because he'd been involved in those arguments for 20 years yeah, already. So. Yeah. Important transition after Walensky is David Kemp. Yes. And David Kemp comes in as Fraser's principal private secretary, as they were. They're later called chiefs of staff, but at this stage, principal private secretary. Before Fraser is elected, he starts working on this can be a much more efficient setup if we have very clear policy roles mm. in the offices. Because under Whitlam, it had been a bit Everybody sort of did a bit amorphous. of everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 One of the people in the Whitlam office said, I was a useful young man. I would just do enough, everything they threw at me. <laughs> <laughs> and so Kemp actually refines the office. And I think that's important too, but also you probably know very well that before the election, he writes a very important paper called A Leader and a Philosophy, mm. which argues you've got to have a clear agenda, you've got to have a philosophy for government. Yes. That's what Menzies had. All sorts of things have gone amiss while Labor's been in office. They've sort of wrecked the joint. <laughs> and now we've got to fix it and we have to know what to do. And so he was obviously basing that on observations of what had worked well, for Menzies. He's a political but scientist, exactly, yeah. but also what had gone yeah. wrong in the yeah. Whitlam office. I mean the Whitlam office the eggheads, as they were, that became to be known, these ad advisors, they became personalities in their own right, didn't they, in Australia? I mean, people, yeah, some of them people did. knew yeah. of them, which is unusual for even today. I wouldn't really know who are the individuals in the Prime Minister's yeah. office, particularly. But some of them did really important work. Pat Troy, in the sort of area of urban planning, he doesn't come into the Prime Minister's office. He does all the advising stuff in opposition and then he becomes. Secretary of the Department of Urban and Regional Development, and if his ideas had been allowed to prosper, the housing problems we see in the paper every day now would have been solved. But, of course, they're only there for three years. Mm. Much of this stuff doesn't get up. His ideas are very expensive. It's logical when Fraser comes in that he's going to say, well, we can't afford this. But I think it sows a seed, it keeps coming back. Brian Howe, when he becomes a minister responsible for urban development in the Hawke and Keating years, is still drawing on things that Pat Troy and those people had to back in in the Whitlam government. So there's all sorts of interesting threads that come out of this. But I think the key message I would have is that at some point the office just becomes too involved, the Prime Minister's office, too interfering. And does that then lend itself to this development of 
presidential style politics that we have observed in Australia. It feels like a relatively recent phenomenon, but it probably isn't. Well, it, it's, it's it, partly that, but it's also a change in the parties themselves. The real problem for both parties in the late 20th century and early 21st century is that the mass parties disappear, really. Yes. Yeah. And people are no longer sort of wedded to particular and the parties, both parties, or all parties, but both the major parties also become much more narrowly focused because their membership is smaller. Mm. The mass parties had large memberships. Because they had large memberships, they were genuinely broad, broad church. So you had to listen to a diversity of opinions, even within your own party. It's from the British context, but we had Lord Jonathan Sumption here last year and right. he did make a comment that the membership of the British Conservative Party had gone from several hundred thousand a yeah. few decades ago and now was smaller than the Royal Society of Birdwatchers. Yeah. Well, that's often <laughs> said about our parties that, the, you know, neither party has a membership as big as the Collingwood Football Club. Oh, goodness, not and, a chance. And people say, would you want <laughs> Collingwood Football Club running your life. <laughs> and so the parties become, they're not broad, and either they're not broad ranging in the way that they once were. No. And that's been sort of problematic, I think, on both sides. So do you think we will see a reversion to a smaller prime ministerial office, a reversion to using the public service? more for advice directly than political advisors in the office or is this just well, set in stone now and it will be with no, us? No, I think so much has gone badly of late and that's it's partly because minister's offices and prime minister's office become much more interventionist, often with adverse outcomes, but also governments of all persuasions have gone to outside advice to big consulting firms. Of course, seen, very apt. It's yeah, in the news at the moment. We've seen the problems that causes. And so there's a real sort of pressure when I talk to people in these trials now, they have to rebuild the public service. That's the message and it's from both sides. But certainly Glenn Davis, who I know quite well, who's the current Secretary of Prime Minister and Cabinet, his role was how do we turn this around? How do we rebuild the public service? Because the money we're spending huge amounts of money on these external consultants. Sure, sure. And is it that the public service is not, I mean, external consultants are used for a reason. Presumably the governments of the day feel they provide the advice they want. Is there a sense that the public service is not match fit to provide that advice? So well, we it's not turn- match fit now, but it's because governments decided I think at a time when it was match fit, instead of having a standing army of all these thousands of public servants, why don't you get a much smaller public service and just to, when you need extra things, you go to consultants? That doesn't start because of a coalition government's wanting to cut. It starts with Hawke and Keating, mm. this notion that, A, that markets in some respects, market-driven actors will do things more efficiently than will a sort of standing army of public servants and also that they might be more, if they're only going to be paid if you... If they, they give you the answer you want because yeah. you're paying them their bills. Uh, <laughs> it's sort of cutting out the middleman. And I think that's been a mistake. We've seen the, the outcome of that and, again, it's not limited to any one government and difficulty is if you look at, as I have, at the period between the 40s and the 1980s, there's these continuous threads of people who've been in various positions throughout the public service. They've got a huge amount of intellectual capital, if you like, sure. built in. All of that has been swept away by this regime that's sort of emerged over the last sort of 15 or 20 years where you contract out and people who used to have all that history and knowledge, have gone. It's a different game. And you can say, well, but yeah, but we're getting young people, cutting-edge people, people up with the latest theories, not old stodgers who are <laughs> you know, just plodding through mm. the ranks. But it hasn't worked all that well. And so I think 
really, you know, I don't know whether Glenn Davis and Co can do it. It's an open question. I feel like this is a podcast for another day, Jim, about <laughs> the use of consultants instead of public servants and do we want a standing army of public servants or do we rely on market forces to provide consulting services as required depending on the issues yeah, and yeah. depending on the capabilities you need. It's a really, really interesting question and yeah. definitely one for another day. But Jim, Walter, thank you so much for joining me on Afternoon Light. It's a hugely interesting topic and one that we are sort of on the periphery quite familiar with, with seeing Prime Minister's offices in and out of the media over the years, but actually understanding how different it was from the Menzies era, Curtin, Chief Lee, even Federation and the changes that really started to take place in the 70s onwards. It's really, really important that we all know that. So you've been an absolute superstar in, in explaining it all to us so eloquently. So thank you. Thanks, Georgina. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook. Facebook.